This podcast is sponsored by A. Miller George Funeral Home, where each life is celebrated, and their sister company, Cremation London and Middlesex, both family owned and operated. By Hyde Park Care Pharmacy. Experience the difference an independent pharmacy can make for you and your loved ones. Hyde Park Care Pharmacy offers personalized care, short wait time, very competitive pricing, easy transfer of your prescription, and much more. And by Molly Maid. During these times of COVID-19, it has never been more important to keep your family safe. With the healthy home cleaning system, Molly Maid London is here to help. Make your home a healthy haven. Call Molly Maid London today. Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whenever and wherever you may be watching and listening today, we welcome you to another edition of the Vickers Crossing podcast. The Vickers Crossing is a virtual space where faith intersects with the public square. I'm Rob Henderson, and I'm the uh, rector and priest at Holy Trinity St. Stephen's Anglican Church here in London, Ontario. My name is Kevin George. I'm the priest and uh, rector of uh, St. Aidan's Church in Northwest London, uh, the second vicar of the Vickers Crossing. My name's Ian. I'm not the third vicar of the Vicar's Crossing. He, he's the dude. He's yeah. the dude. Dude in his room. <laughs> yeah. with, with a new computer, I understand. Yeah, I bought a new computer because my old one couldn't keep up with what I wanted it to do. It still mm-hmm. like works, so I'm going to use it for like school and things like that, but this one yep. is beefy. I think, uh, well, that's what people usually say about me, but I, I, uh, I want to say that with this, with this new, new uh, computer you've got, the camera is so good, I think we, we can better see your dimples. So this, uh, you may pick up a few more admirers out of this, you never know. That's oh, right. great. That's Thank you. Yeah. And we are thrilled to be able to welcome in our latest guest, the Vickers Crossing podcast, uh, Richard Back. Richard, welcome. Oh, I'm excited to be here. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. It's great to have you with us. I know you're in Texas, right? I am Abilene, Texas. High of uh, 107 Fahrenheit today. Oh my goodness, Moses! Please, please tell me the air conditioner is working okay. Uh, it, it is. Yeah, it good. Working yesterday, we had a guy out yesterday fixing it just in the nick of time. Oh Ooh. wow! We were chatting with uh, uh, someone in the UK. Yes, or Tuesday or what? what last Tuesday, last yeah. Week? Tuesday. Yeah. Uh, Baroness uh, Ruth um, Hunt. Hunt. And she's in the UK and they live in those flats. And she says the hottest they've ever had it in the UK and they don't have air there. Yeah. No. So she was sweating through the whole podcast. And yeah. It had nothing to do with us. <laughs> it was, it was over 90 over there and they don't have yeah. air conditioning. Was, they don't uh, do that. Exciting. So, well, we're thrilled to have you Richard and, uh, and Kevin's going to give you a more formal introduction to our, to our listeners coming up in just a few minutes. Um, but we want to say thank you to our sponsors as always, who help us keep the podcast on the air to a Miller George funeral home, Dave Mullen and his staff, at A. Miller George, where each life is celebrated, and their sister company, Cremation London and Middlesex, both family owned and operated. Well, that's deadly. Um, sorry, <laughs> it was just there. <laughs> you were waiting to do that one for months. <laughs> I usually throw that in once in a while. Anyway, we're happy to, with a couple of new sponsors we have this year. One of them to try and keep you from the funeral home is the pharmacy. And uh, you want to go to Hyde Park Care Pharmacy and see Carol. It's locally owned, locally operated, and locally loved. Carol Basada, thank you very much, and we're glad to have you on board. And also to keep your space clean, I mean, I need to do that, but also to Molly Maid and uh, they'll help you make your home a healthy haven. Call Molly Maid London today. And thank you to Trista Lister for that. Yeah. All, so, right. All right. Heck yeah. Well, we, we do appreciate our sponsors and, and their support of what we're doing here on the Vickers Crossing. Um, so uh, a little bit of a new, this is our third season and our what, what third or fourth episode we're in. Fourth now. episode. Four now. already? Holy smokes. Yeah. Two weeks, um, four episodes. So this is the fourth time of a new little game we like to play here in the Vickers Crossing. And this is a game that we call Sickness or Suds. <coughs> oh. <coughs> so, you want to explain uh, what yeah, happens yeah. here? What happens here is after hours of research, I bring to my fellow folks on the Vickers Crossing a word or phrase. It's up to you to figure out whether it's a sickness uh-huh. or a sud, which is another word for a beer. A beer. It was like a sudsy yeah. beverage. Okay. Yeah, sudsy, okay. sudsy beverage. Sudsy okay. adult, appropriate adult beverage. Okay. All right. So here's our um, word or phrase for today. Night fog. Ooh. Night fog. Is that a sickness 
or a <laughs> sud. Ah, uh, so, yeah. so let's go to uh, let's go to to Ian first. Let him huh. think about that. Would you would you be more apt to say you know uh, come down with the night fog, or you know barkeep, um, barkeep I need a a picture of night fog for my friends. I'm gonna say it's a sud. It sounds yeah. like something that would uh, be a combatant against like someone who what's the word like not a contestant like you know how coke and pepsi are like opposites yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. it seems like yeah. that for guinness you know what i mean okay, okay. night fog night, night fog, fog. Yeah. what do you think He's... richard do you want to get in on this i'm with ian sounds like a stout sounds like okay a stout. Yeah. that's yep. actually i i should i, I should make, make it sure. should i make it unanimous i wonder or should <laughs> i i'll to be a contrarian i will say it's some sort of a sickness i think i think once in a while, I find myself at uh, two in the morning in a night fog. Sure, sure. Okay, okay. I'll All right. go with that. Well, friends, uh, night fog is an actual beer. Oh. And uh, night fog black hazy IPA is from Austin Beer Works in Austin, Texas. All right, very. Richard. So there you go. It's in state. It's a local local brew for you. That's yeah. how I knew that. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Austin is a good place for beer. Yeah, indeed. <laughs> so there we go. Another ed uh, edition of Sickness or Suds. And our next uh, segment, of course, is to check in with Ian. And we get, we get questions from our listeners about a lot of different topics. And Kevin and I really can't answer them. That's why we created we this, turned Ian. this uh, yeah, portion of the podcast. It's called Ask Ian Anything. Oh, ask okay. Ian anything. Yeah. Wow. So where's our question from today, Cap? Our question today comes from Nashville, Tennessee. A young lady there named Roseanne. She wants to know what is your favorite Johnny Cash tune? Because we have we have an author on today who's mm. gonna, who's who's got a great book uh, called uh, Trains Jesus and Murder. Is that the right order? I think the Gospel According to Johnny Trains, Cash. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Trains Jesus and Murder, and uh, and so Roseanne from Nashville, uh, wants to know, what is your favorite Johnny Cash tune? Um, uh, uh, hmm. You're the musician. You should know. Yeah, that. he sings, he plays, he writes music, he does all of it. You must have a Johnny Cash tune you like. I definitely do. They're all pretty good. Um, yeah. I like um, Folsom Prison because I can play it on the guitar. Because okay. it's like super fun and, and boom, 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 quick. Boom, 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 yeah. Boom, boom. Um, and then he did a cover of Hurt, didn't he? Mm -hmm. And that one, we actually, okay. we talked about that in class. So that one also stuck with me pretty, because it's super like. Tell Richard what you're yeah. doing in class, by the way, just so you can get right. a context for that. Right. So I, I study music industry arts at Fanshawe. It's a program that is about music production and engineering. I can tell people I'm an engineer, but of sound so mm. yeah oh, that's okay. what i do yeah yeah so you you talked about the song hurt in your in your program yes because it was one of those um because johnny cash is such like a big star i don't mm -hmm. know if that's the right way to say that but like he was he was the legend huge. and yeah. then like he sort of fell off of the planet mm -hmm. and then he came back with hurt and then what passed away a year later yeah. or something mm -hmm. like that so yeah. like that song that hurt song is 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 not only like a a good cover but it's also sort of like a, in requiem of his mm. fallen career in a way so no, that's I mean, what we talked about in class it was really cool yeah yeah, yeah it's cool introduced him to a whole new audience now rob yeah. i know you're not a big uh country music fan but do you have a johnny cash tune that will be your favorite I, yeah well i i don't know a lot of his stuff but uh, which is a little embarrassing to say because before i was a priest i was the radio disc jockey on an oldies radio station <laughs> should probably know. but the one song that we just always play that everybody knows is ring of fire right mm, yeah so that was like on every two hours so i would right. those late nights where i'd be working midnight to five at least a couple of times a night i'd be half asleep you know singing ring of fire in the studio so that's probably my favorite uh, i usually deal with the ring of fire after too many hot wings but yeah, that's another yeah, story that's another story but, yeah. but, but what about but what about richard richard's the man's written about johnny cash you you so is there a favorite in all those tunes yeah it's hard to pick um um like ian like i like Folsom prison blues a lot um mm -hmm. but i think my favorite is when the man comes around oh yeah um, another 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 late song from the Rick Rubin years uh, yeah. when he did hurt. I think it's the same album actually. Yes. Uh, yeah. That hurt is covered on. 
Yeah, yeah. No, that's good. Good too. All, All right. right. Uh, well, well. Sorry, Kevin. Go ahead. Oh, I was going to say I get to pick my favorite, don't I? Oh yeah. Sorry. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So <laughs> I think my favorite, and I know I know it well. I've I've even karaoke it when I've had too many of those midnight fogs or whatever they're called. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, is boy named Sue. I Boy just, yeah. I yeah, think that one too. Yeah. I think I like that because of the redemption sort of aspect of it that, yeah. you know, in the end he's got this need for revenge and in the end it, it, it never materializes. He realizes that there's the revenge is not going to get him what he needs. And he, mm -hmm. there's this reconciliation involved, which, but he's still not going to name his son Sue, right. but it's, right. it's, it's really a great song. That's great. I think I got to go on Spotify when this is done today and check out some Johnny Cash music because I just haven't heard it for, <laughs> yeah. for a while. So that's great. Well, we're thrilled to have uh, Richard with us. And Kevin, would you give him a more formal introduction for our listeners? I would indeed. Um, I really like his, uh, if, you, if you really want to get a, a great picture, read his bio from Sojourners. I, I just think that's your best. But So I'll share a bit of that with you because it's fun. Richard Beck is a professor and department chair of psychology at Albaline Christian University. He's married to Jana and they have two sons, Brent and an Aiden, for which our church is named here, St. Aiden. Mm -hmm. um, they also have a dog, Bandit, who keeps Richard company when he works away on his blog, Experimental Theology, which I can say, incredible blog. Love it. Uh, Richard's area of interest, be it research, writing, or blogging, is the interface of Christian theology and psychology, with a particular focus on how existential issues affect Christian belief and practice. Richard's published research covers topics as diverse as psychology, uh, the psychology of profanity, to why Christian bookstore art is so bad. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> and, his, and in his blog, Richard will spend enormous amounts of time writing about the theology of Calvin and Hobbes and the demonology of Scooby-Doo for his latest Bible class on monsters. But that doesn't capture all of the man. He's also a prison chaplain uh, to the men in white. Uh, he is a, a, an incredibly involved person in his local church community. Uh, you'll find him in the classroom. His books are incredible. We'll talk about a couple of those today, Stranger God, as well as Trains, uh, Jesus and Murder, the Gospel According to Johnny Cash. Uh, I read last night, I sat down and read entirely uh, on my Kindle, uh, Reviving Old Scratch, which is a great book. Uh, really, really loved it. So pumped out a, a few quotes on Facebook that, 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 that are in there. If, if you folks take a look at my page. Um, we're just really excited to have you with us, Richard. Welcome. Oh, thank you. I'm excited to talk about all this stuff. Fun stuff. <laughs> yeah, it is indeed. So uh, let's, let's start. Uh, there's so many places we could start with all this writing. I mean, I think you, get the, uh, you got the idea from our communication that for us, our focus is really around faith and where it intersects with the public square. And I think so much of what you've written about, whether it's about Christian hospitality or the work of people like Johnny Cash, who through his own uh, music, uh, entered into solidarity with a lot of issues um, that, that uh, were facing him in his times. Um, I absolutely love all of your writing. So I want to start with Stranger God, your book, Stranger God. Um, listeners, if you've not read, read this book yet, I'd strongly urge you to get out and get it. Buy it from your local bookstore if you can. But if you, if you can't do that, you'll get it on Amazon. Um, it's the most well-written book on uh, the theology of Christian hospitality I've ever read, and I've read quite a few of them, and uh, it's, it's just really well done. You begin in the book by uh, positing that hospitality begins as a spiritual discipline, uh, habit-forming practice, what we may call habitus, um, and you speak of Teresa Lisieux as the exemplar, uh, the little way that she exercised, uh, which was a deep practice that she developed, encouraging followers mm -hmm. of Jesus to entertain angels unawares in everything that they do. Change in heart is what you, you posit is required for true hospitality to take root. Christians often think, and I, I think some of the uh, uh, hospitality team meetings we've had here and in other churches I've served where we think that the, the act of Christian hospitality is that act of being like, like God, like, you know, we're, we're trying to be hospitable. It's the Christian thing to do. But you really turn that around and embrace the theology that I believe Jesus really uh, embodied, which is about welcoming God in the stranger. Uh, in those that we don't notice, those that are on the margins or, or on the margins of the margins, in fact. Before hospitality, you say, uh, before hospitality can make space in the world around our tables, it has to be begin closer to home with an inward emotional revolution. 
hospitality starts with the spontaneous and unconditional welcome we extend towards others. I wonder if you can share with our listeners about that notion of hospitality, how you see it, and how you've experienced it yourself. I mean, some of the stories you share in the book, whether it's your prison ministry or the ministry in your community, which does a lot of, of, of incredible work in, uh, uh, with people who are really on the margins, um, you've seen that Christian hospitality at work in different ways. Can you share that with our listeners, please? Yeah, I I think like you had mentioned, one of the one of the things I entertain in the book is that kind of surprising reversal you see in Matthew twenty five, where in the parable of the sheep and the goats, um, both the sheep and the goats ask, "When did we ever see you, Lord?" And he responds, "You saw me whenever you welcomed the stranger, whenever you visited the incarcerated, gave a drink to the thirsty, fed the hungry." And what's interesting about that parable is that the one doing the good deed is not, is not identified as Christ, but Christ is identified as the stranger, as the incarcerated, as the homeless, as the hungry. And, and that, that is a big reversal that I think a lot of Christian communities need, struggle with because we mm. tend to think of Christian hospitality is I am standing as the Christ figure helping this needy, uh, impoverished, uh, or marginalized person. And so there's a lot of temptation, savior complex uh, things get involved in there. Um, but but the, the thing in hospitality I talk about in the book is how God comes to us in the strangers. Um, and, and we need to open ourselves up for that. So um, you mentioned I'm a prison chaplain. And when I first started going out to the, to the prison, so it's a maximum security prison. You referred to them as the men in white. We call them the men in white because Texas dresses their inmates in all white. And so the chaplains just call them the men in white. So the, the first weeks I was out there, they asked me, you know, why, why do you come out here? Why, why do you spend so much time with us? You have a family, you have a life. Why would you want to spend time with us? And I said, because Matthew 25, uh, um, I'm not coming out here as a do-gooder. Um, I'm looking for God. And, and my faith at that time was at a very low ebb. And um, so I really was searching for God and Jesus told me where I could locate him. And I went out to prison and I've discovered over the years, as I share in many of my books, uh, the many ways grace comes to me in unlikely places. So that's kind of the heart of it. Just getting our heads around that reversal. We're doing these things because God is already at work. He's already in these locations. Uh, and in many ways we extend hospitality because God is trying to save us through these other uh these other people in these locations. Mm -hmm. the, the psychological part of the book, though, is that it's easy to say what I just said. Mm. Uh, we, we can preach sermons about all of this stuff, and we can create hospitality ministries and initiatives, but, um, but people are still hesitant. They're still anxious around strangers. Uh, in, a, in a highly polarized political environment, there's still a lot of anger and feelings about you know, people. And so an emotional obstacle has to get overcome. So when I talk about this inward emotional revolution, I'm really talking about the social, the, you know, the lived social psychological biases, prejudices, reactions, triggers we have around difference. Mm. And then what we have to do to kind of deal with those triggers. Because the, the thing is, those emotional triggers are automatic, often unconscious and instantaneous. And so the, as I like to tell churches, you know, this battle for hospitality is won or lost in milliseconds. Mm. And so it tends not to be a decisional choice. Will I or will I not extend hospitality? It is typically a fast, automatic, hot take about a person. I don't like them or I find them scary. I'm uncomfortable. Right. I'm angry. And then once those emotions are play, it's really hard to kind of gather back in the image of God in that person. Hmm. So it's, it sounds like a, a good conversation to have with a hospitality group in, in, in church when we come back, because we're all like that right now. <laughs> but when we come back, like you know, hospitality group, like Kevin says, is, is not so much around um, these are the things we can do to be hospitable, but how are we experiencing these strangers that are coming in and what's making us uncomfortable and kind of get to the root of that? Is that what I'm, I'm hearing you, you talk yeah. about? I have yeah. a whole chapter in Stranger God where I just take a tour of emotional triggers. Mm. Um, and, and it's interesting because I, I do a lot of equipping with churches where I will come in and spend a weekend kind of doing the, this material kind of on equipping ministries. And, and we'll just kind of slowly go through a tour of these triggers because at the start of that, everybody kind of sees themselves as a generous, kind-hearted, hospitable person. 
Um, and sadly, my, my message is like, no, you're, you're a bit of a hater. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, like, well, what do you mean I'm a hater? Yeah. I'm like, well, I can probably locate your hate within a f- couple of seconds, you know? Yeah. And, and, and so like, if I'm in California, you know, all I need to, to do is mention um, gun owners and all of a sudden like, oh, those yeah. people, you know? Yeah. But if I'm, in, if I'm in Texas, all I need to do is mention vegans. And yeah. they're like, to- oh, those, those people, you know? To- tofu will set somebody off. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it's very easy. If you just kind of inventory your heart or just watch how you're reacting to social media, you got some feelings. You have Whoa. some feelings. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so what, what, what are like those triggers? Can you say a little bit more about what they look like? Well, I mean, you know, politics is the easy one, but yeah. uh, obviously race is a big one is, mm-hmm. is, as well. Um, yeah. I don't, but, but like I said, um, there's other little triggers, for example, like habits. So for example, in middle-class American churches, smoking is a highly moralized habit. Mm. And so if you see somebody out front of the church smoking a cigarette, you're going to have a kind of, you know, your normal Sunday going church person is going to have some, some feelings about that person. They mm. might not think that they're a, a serial killer or anything, but you know, you, there's, there's a moralized hot take about, you know, a smoker. Mm. And, but if you work a lot in recovery communities, like I do, you're around smokers all the time. Right. Um, you know, after every AA meeting, there's tons of people out there smoking. And, and so, so that's, that's one thing. As, as, as an example that kind of outside of politics outside of race little little habits so i mentioned like hunting or hobbies mm-hmm. or lifestyles so vegans or hunters or gun mm-hmm. owners and how we have moralized feelings about all of that um, as well you know some of it if i work with marginalized populations and so there's going to be hygiene triggers so some of them aren't values mm-hmm. issues but they're literally olfactory smells mm-hmm. that a lot of people can't deal with um i've seen people struggle in, in my little church, Freedom Fellowship, we serve a meal each week for very poor and homeless people. And I've seen a lot of my very liberal elitist friends um, refuse to eat the food that we serve because they have all of these, <laughs> they have all these food triggers. Like they won't eat processed cheese. And so, because you know, it's, that's contaminating. And so, yeah. um, well, you kind of know how like a lot of liberals are very afraid of like sugar. no like that's the worst thing in the world and and to be clear i'm a fan you know i love sugar and and, but but so what's interesting is how we have all of these triggers and they can be food triggers that cause us not to sit down at a meal Mm -hmm. i'm I'm happy to serve a meal but 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 to share it with somebody to break bread in the soup kitchen, a lot of people stumble at that point just for these emotional reasons. They're they were disgusted by the food, right. and, and and listen, the list goes on and on. It's interesting to me because years ago when I was a student, which going back a ways now because I had hair and I was thin, but I was here in the city at a, at a, at another parish as a student, and we had just taken on uh, a regular weekly rotation at a local um, downtown uh, place called Arc Aid, which was serving food to to uh, the homeless and so on. And uh, it was brand new. And these are all suburbanites, you know, and everybody with their nice cars. And we'd meet at the church and then we'd carpool down and we'd go in. And, it, and, and just as you talk about in your community, we saw everything, right? I mean, it was, there was nothing you didn't see. I mean, it was, there was all, all kinds of um, human suffering going on. And I remember, uh, it's that business though. Like, I mean, just how hospitable are you? Because we met at the thing one night and they all take a turn driving. And there was a woman uh, who pulled in, it was her turn. And she said, if you don't mind, would you take my turn? And I said, Oh, you, you don't drive downtown. She said, well, no, my Jeep is brand new. And I'd rather not drive my brand new Jeep in that part of town. Yeah. And I don't want to go East of Adelaide is what we call it here. EOA. You don't want to go East of Adelaide with my new Jeep. And I'm thinking like, what? <laughs> There's that trigger, right? That you're talking about to think about, well, I can't take my car in there. Um, or another person who we just, we tried everything with him, but he, every time he would touch somebody, it's different now COVID, but every time he would touch somebody, he'd go to the sink and wash his hands because he's, he, you know, because of that hygiene thing that you were mm-hmm. referring to. It's interesting. There it are limits, there are limits to hospitality, I guess, which is where Rob is headed. Yeah, exactly. I wanted to, to get into the idea of, uh, of open table or open tables, uh, the Anglican church, a very sacramental church. Obviously we have Eucharist every week for the most part. And uh, there's an ongoing conversation in Anglican circles about open tables. Um, and I remember us having a big conversation at a clergy conference a few years ago with our bishop and uh, all the different takes on open table. 
Um, some feel strongly that the table is, is, you know, reserved for the baptized. You gotta, you gotta be part of the family to eat at the table. Um, others have feelings about the spiritual state someone is in before coming to the table. Um, the, our, our book of common prayer prayer, uh, that so many in our Anglican circles know, you know, you, you that do truly and earnestly repent you of your sins and our love and charity with your neighbors and our intent to lead a new life. It's like once you're, once you're in a good spiritual spot, then, you know, the table will be open. Um, but others take the position that true Christian hospitality is a table that's open to all. And you're right about this in, in your book, Stranger God, in the context of whether there are limits or boundaries to hospitality. I'm wondering if you could, Richard, share a little bit uh, about the story that you share in the book and, and how you feel about Open Table. Well, um, yeah, so to, to kind of connect back with the, the comment earlier about um, the, the practices of the little way from Therese of Lesu, um, the, the, the point is, if we recognize that hospitality is stumbling over some emotional triggers, then we have to face the, the other psychological phenomenon that those emotions are hard to just change. It, it, you know, it's like if you're ever sad and somebody walks up to you and says, you should cheer up. You're like, oh, well, thank you. I Thanks love for that. Oh, Thanks. Yes, uh, <laughs> um, or if you're, you're very anxious and somebody says, well, don't worry about that. that Problem that, solved. Right. That these, 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 these commands to change your feelings are very hard. And so if people are st struggling with social emotions, then just telling them to be hospitable or don't feel that way. Quit, you, know, you don't need to be comfortable. You don't need to be afraid. Um, quit being so angry. Then, then you know, that's going to fail. So, so what we do know about kind of psycho psychological science is those we can change emotions more gradually and slowly through practices and habits that slowly help rewire. So we need those practices. And so one of the things I talk about in my writings is how the Eucharist itself can be a practice of hospitality, but it, it, it is gonna stumble on in traditions, that recommendation will stumble in traditions that practice a closed table. And in fact, in many ways, you can argue that that closed table is forming you in the opposite direction, right? Mm -hmm. That you're standing in front of the community with a kind of keep out sign, you know, yeah. you, um, and, and I describe how the ordering um, of, of Jesus healing the leper in, in Mark one is a very interesting thing to reflect on. So when the leper comes to Jesus and says, can you make me clean? Um, scripture says Jesus touches him first. And so he embraces his humanity. Miroslav Volf calls that the will to embrace. You embrace mm -hmm. somebody as they are, where they stand. And Jesus kind of even enters into solidarity with his uncleanliness. And then Jesus says, be clean. Mm -hmm. It's a different story if the order is reversed. Like, be clean, and then you can approach, you know, for, for the embrace. Right. Right. And, and, so, and so my concern about closed communion is that it flips that ordering. It says you have to get your act together, then you're, then you're welcome to this meal. And I understand the rich Eucharistic theology, and I love rich Eucharistic theology. But, but sometimes I wish that we could flip those sacraments. Like, like I wish we could be a little bit more, to use a provocative word, promiscuous with the table, mm. and that all sinners are welcome. As, as we kind of almost use the Eucharist as a, a liturgy of Jesus's own table practices. Yes. Where the religious people would say, why is he eating with tax collectors and sinners? And so the, the, the table becomes hosted by the one called the friend of sinners mm -hmm. and all are welcome. Mm -hmm. but, then, but then you might say, well, well, then the Eucharist, you know, but what does it mean? And what about holiness? What about commitment? Well, then to me, then, to me, that's the inner covenantal decision of baptism. Like that, like that to me is like, okay, you've been welcome to this table, but if you want to mark your life in a cruciform way, mm -hmm. then the sacrament of baptism is here for you right. as that more inner circle. Um, right. Like if you want to, you've been welcome to this table, maybe as a stranger, but if you want to make this story your own, then I think, I'll, so I almost think we, we should, Normally, Lipid. baptism is the outer ring, protecting <laughs> yeah. the table. And I almost wish we'd flip it. Flip the table yeah. be the outer ring, 
and then baptism be that covenantal like circumcision function in the Old Testament that becomes yeah. that kind of covenantal like this is my team this is my life I pledge my allegiance in this in this baptism Church. but yeah. I get how you know some churches lack the theological or doctrinal capacities to, to make that. That's just kind of my perspective. Well, it's, it's interesting because when Rob mentioned about clergy conference a few years ago, the speaker was Nadia Bowles Weber. And, uh, and, and she was talking about all sinners and all saints, her church at the time. Um, and the question that was asked by one of our colleagues was, how do you, and how do you have so many adult baptisms? You know, because we do infant baptism more than adult baptism just by virtue of the way. How do you have them? She said, well, it's pretty simple. She said, we just welcome everybody who comes to the table. And then once their lives are changed, it's exactly what you're talking about. Mm-hmm. They come and they say, well, I want to enter further into this. I want to be baptized. And it was at that point that a bishop stood and reminded us that that's not the way we do it here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and my experience is that coming back to the church later in life, um, and my wife and I wanted to get married, and we hadn't been to, to church for years, and we were feeling some guilt and shame around that in the sense that we uh, all of a sudden wanted the church there or wanted the minister there because we needed something, right? So now, now we'll start coming and showing up. And I remember a conversation with him in, in his office explaining to him all the reasons um, why we weren't there and, and things that had happened to us in the past and blah, 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 blah. And he basically looked at us and said, yeah, I don't care. Tell me about yourselves. And that was the embracing of, now that I look back on it, right? The embracing of the humanity right at the beginning. That it wasn't about all the rules and regulations that we felt and hoops that we had to jump over for him to say yes. It was about him uh, opening that space for us to see us as who we were and enter into that relationship. And that's really what triggered us returning back to church. And then later I ended up being a priest. So, <laughs> you know, who knows? But uh, anyway, that's, that's important. But it's sure. that initial hospitality you were offered. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So. And, and it's not that, you know, if we're speaking about Episcopalian church, it's not like you're devoid of a liturgy of hospitality. Like you can come forward and receive a no. blessing. I mean, like it's, it's not, you know, you're not like say, Hey, stay in the seat. And we're not going to be welcoming you. So, you know, they're, they're trying to find ways to, have that be a, a moment of blessing for everybody, no matter right. where they stand. Right. Well, and as I always tell people, I don't check the baptismal certificates at the altar rail. So yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's right. The communion police, sir. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great to see. So, mm-hmm. Ian, Ian, I have a question. Ian, the yeah. music man. I want to yeah. I want to transfer over to talk about your book, Trains Jesus and Murder. Which, by the way, what a cool title. That's a really <laughs> cool title. Um, so, I'm a singer songwriter, which is I think we talked about this before the podcast or during it's whatever let's move on so in the book you write jesus in being one with us where in suffering and ultimately being crucified is an act of solidarity you quote bonifer bonifer bonhoeffer bonhoeffer Bonhoeffer. my bad bonhoeffer who writes god is not ashamed of the lowless lowliness of human beings god marches right in he chooses people as his instruments and performs his wonders where one would least expect them God is near to lowliness. He loves the lost, the, 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 the neglected, the unseemly, the excluded, the weak and broken. What people say is lost, God is found. What people say is condemned, God says is, sa- is saved. Where people say no, God says yes. Where people turn their eyes away in indifference and arrogance, God gazes with a love that grows warmer than any, than, grows warmer there than anywhere else. Where people say something is despicable, God calls it blessed. You say that sums up the gospel according to Johnny Cash, the man in black, drawing near to and loving the lost, unnoticed, unremarkable, excluded, powerless, broken, condemned, and despicable. Solidarity, solidarity is a love that grows warmest in the coldest places. And that's a theme that, that follows throughout the whole book. And I want to know, like, tell us why um, and how, I guess, the music of Johnny Cash shines light on the importance of solidarity with the vulnerable. Yeah, I mean, some of it's my own biography. I mean, I was mm-hmm. um, a, I mean, I knew a little bit about Johnny Cash the way everybody knows a little bit about Elvis Presley, you know, knew a few of his poems. You know, it's, it's just basic America, Americana literacy, you know who Johnny Cash is. But I didn't really follow his music closely. Um, but I had been, as I had mentioned, I started leading this Bible study out of the prison and one day found a, a bargain Ben Deal, uh, uh, the CD of his live at Folsom Prison concert. Yeah. And popped it in, just thought, hey, this would be cool. I'll listen to a prison concert on the way to the prison back and forth. And like, you know, a lot of people who listen to that album realize that this is a special kind of historic album in music history. 
And, and it's because of the environment. It's because it's live in a prison. And you hear the guards breaking in. You hear the, the inmates booing the warden. You hear them <laughs> cheering and stomping their feet. And I was like, man, I know that world. And, and the, it's the enthusiasm of that crowd that makes that album so electric. And the reason why they're so enthusiastic goes to the point of solidarity. Like, Cash went to them and he sang songs. If you listen to the album, he sings these really dark songs, you know? <laughs> he's, he's, but he was able to give voice to their experience. And they felt, as I describe in the book, they felt seen. And to me, that movement towards the broken, to the sinner, to the marginalized, or in the language of Paul, right, that Christ comes and dies for the ungodly, that, that trajectory of moving towards um, the broken and the lost, as Bonhoeffer talks about, um, to me, that's the gospel. And so that concert, to me, is just a sacramental sign, that that, that is a visible sign of what the gospel is all about. And, um, and he not just did it with that concert, but he also did it with his music. And so he's called the man in black. Um, a lot of people think that's an outlaw image, mm. but he wrote a song um, in the sixties, sang it the first time at Vanderbilt university, race riots were happening. Uh, Vietnam war was raging. It's not dissimilar to the stuff that we're seeing around our news feeds today. A lot of social unrest. And those college students were kind of kept pushing him like, you know, Mr. Cash, what do you, what do you believe? What do you stand up for? And he wrote this song called the man in black. And uh, I'd ask your listeners to check it out. It's not my favorite song musically of his, but to me, the lyrically it's his best song because he begins it with, you know, I wear the black for the poor and the beaten down living in the hopeless, hungry side of town. And so he interprets his black attire as a sign of grief, like funeral clothing, mm. um, standing with in, in lament and sadness, um, the people who have been marginalized. And he goes through the whole song, kind of naming those locations of desolation in the American landscape. And so it wasn't just going to the prison, but it's also the way he used his music to speak for those who didn't have a voice. Mm. it's wow. pretty cool i did would you mind sharing i made the, the one thing I, as i think about that solidarity um uh he had a trip to the white house and uh the and the expectation about what he would sing and what he chose to sing i think speaks to that too well, could you share that when was yeah, this you, sorry there, there's a great netflix documentary about this i think it's called um tricky dick and the man in black okay um, and Tricky Dick was obviously Richard Nixon. Yeah. And Nixon invited Johnny Cash to the White House. And Cash, you know, and I wrestle with this in the book. Um, you know, he was a very patriotic person, served in the Air Force, loved his country, you know, honored the president. Um, and so he was going to go. He was going to do a concert in the White House. And so he went, which dismayed a lot of his younger, uh, more progressive, um, socially conscious uh, fans. Mm -hmm. um, but Nixon wanted him to sing an Oki from Muskogee, which was a, a song, if you read the lyrics, um, is critical, kind of takes some shot at the counterculture movement, especially the war protest movement about Vietnam. Mm -hmm. And then he wanted him to sing Welfare, uh, what was it, Welfare Cadillac, um, which was kind of a dog whistle for black, um, uh, black people taking advantage of welfare. Mm -hmm. So he asked them to sing these two songs that like um, were kind of taking some shots at some things. Cash refuses to sing the songs and instead sings a song he wrote called What is Truth, <laughs> which um, talks about how the young people of America are asking the question, what is truth? Maybe we should be listening to them. Mm -hmm. And by the end of the concert, Nixon quipped, well, the one thing I learned about Johnny Cash is you don't ever tell him what to say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, wow, wow, that's an amazing story. Yeah, uh, yeah. I gotta be listening to some more Johnny Cash, I think, like uh, I said, uh, Spotify is a yeah, order of the day after. Ian, did you, did you have a follow-up, Ian? You were gonna say something, I'm sorry, I think I, I cut you off. 
No, I wanted to know when it was in USA during the Nixon era. So that answered my question. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, so carrying on from what you were saying about, um, particularly like if you listen to that album, I agree. Incredible. The, the Folsom prison blues. I mean, it is everything about it. Uh, when you listen to the whole environment, not just the songs, but the, you know, but what's really cool is, uh, it's a funny word to use for lament, but what's really cool in it for me is the lament. Like the whole thing is like lament. And he sings a song written by, uh, purportedly written by a, a, an inmate, right? So it's this, it's this incredible um, thing. And you write about this in the book. You say lament isn't a failure or a lack of faith. Lament is an active, bold, trusting faith in the midst of pain, suffering, and confusion. In fact, you write, if we ignore lament, we avoid giving voice to despair and rage. The gospel loses its ability to speak honestly, realistically, and truthfully. Without lament, faith grows naive and superficial, a happy fake, glossy facade we paint over the pain and confusion. In addition, lament is the cry of the oppressed, a song of resistance. When we avoid lament, we are marginalizing the voice uh, the voice that is crying out in pain around the world. In some, lament is the shadow of the gospel, the moon to the gospel sun. The bright hope of the gospel creates sharp, dark outlines of contrast around all that is unjust and all that is broken. Lament is that gap separating the new heaven and the new earth from the shadow of the world we find around us. And pointing towards that gap, we are not failing or denying the gospel. Instead, we are praying with tears and raw, cracked voices, may your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. The rage and despair of San Quentin, great song, might not sound like a gospel hymn, but sung by those aching for the redemption and reconciliation of all things, the song is an anthem of resistance and of hope. The sound of the gospel isn't always nice and sweet, and it's often found in some surprising, unsettling places. Just listen to the roar of San Quentin. Richard, there's a lot unfolding in America right now. Uh, you guys are in a hotbed. Uh, 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 talk about a hot take. My hot take is you guys are in a mess. <laughs> so, and uh, we in Canada are watching it and we've got our own hot messes going on here. And I, th I think what's happening, it's not just in America, it's happening around the world globally. There's a shift to uh, uh, nationalism and right-wing politics, which is around sort of control. And we've seen now months long protests of the people rising up in major cities across the United States and the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, you know, black indigenous and persons of color are, are saying enough. Uh, you talk about lament or, or uh, you know, call it whatever you want, but it's, it's a real sense of, of saying uh, we need our voices to be heard. Um, I wonder if you can say more about the importance of lament as a follower of Jesus, both how it related to Johnny Cash in his life and what, how he lived that out, because he lives through some troubled times, not only in his own personal life, but, but what was going on in the world around him, like that time he went to the White House and Vietnam was on, um, and how it relates to our own lives in this time now. Like, I mean, how do we, uh, you know, how do we find a voice? I mean, it's, it's affecting things like, a, you know, a, a presidential, a, a choice for a running mate in, in uh, Kamala Harris yesterday or day before in that saying, you know, it's important. It was important to Joe Biden to pick a person of color and, and a woman. So I just wonder if you can share more about how lament can be important for us now. Um, and, and if you use examples from the book or Johnny Cash or your own life, that's helpful too. Yeah, yeah. You know, we could talk about America. That's our job in America is just to make the whole thing fall apart so everybody can go like, well, at least we're not Americans. You know, so, uh, you know let, so let, me, let, let me back up and talk about Cash and that song in San Quentin. My favorite Johnny Cash moment is on that album, San Quentin. If you look at the track listing, you'll see the song San Quentin listed twice. Mm. And, the, and the reason why it's listed twice is he sings the exact same song back to back. If you listen to the album, um, he steps up to the microphone and he goes, listen, I don't know what it's like. You know, he'd been in jail, never been in prison. I really don't know what it's like to be you guys. But as I try to put myself in your shoes, this is how I would feel about San Quentin. Starts the song and the opening line is, San Quentin, I hate every inch of you. And the minute he starts that line, the, the prisoners sit back and they then just erupt oh, yeah. you gotta listen to the album yeah. they erupt and the song just proceeds in this venomous 
angry rebuke. I mean, there's a line in there that says, San Quentin, may you rot and burn in hell. I mean, it's just over the top language. It's a psalm. Yeah. And yeah, it's very much like the lament psalms. Yeah. They're very angry, very upset. And when the song ends, the, the <laughs> entire room erupts. And you can just hear it. It just, they can't get, they can't start the next song because it, it just goes on and on the cheering and the yelling and the stomping. And they demand him sing it again. Mm. And so he sings it again. That's why it's listed twice. He sings mm. it again. And after the second singing, the, the crowd is screaming even louder. <laughs> and Cash says at that moment, the room kind of tipped, it, 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 kind of culmination of a lot of dangerous energy had filled that room and it was tipping towards a riot. And later Cash said, I felt like if I had said, let's go, the whole place would have just rioted. Yeah. Um, and he, he admitted to being tempted, a little bit tempted to, to just <laughs> lead, lead a prison riot. Yeah. And, and I always say that that's my favorite example of the gospel according to Johnny Cash, which disturbs a lot of people. They're like, why is Johnny Cash starting a prison riot like your favorite gospel moment? And for me, it's to what you're speaking about. It's the reason why the room tipped mm -hmm. is because he had given voice to the voiceless. He had, right. he, he had been able to speak a, this this pain and this anger may you rot and burn to hell. And so that's, you read that long quote for the book. And that's what I'm trying to say is that angry rebuke of that's raw and painful and uncomfortable to hear. And yeah, maybe somebody's a little bit too emotional, you know, and so we want to tone police people. I mean, it's not going to be a nice conversation uh, in these locations. And we're seeing that in America right now where we have to admit um, some pretty dark stuff about us and we have to allow these voices to rage on but those are gospel hymns um, that is the sound not just of lament but of the, of the prophets too mm -hmm. this emotional rebuke and so but but I think you know there's lots of reasons why I think we resist that I think some of its nationalism uh, to admit lament is to admit that somehow we've made mistakes and so there's an idol there's an idol there that that you guys are very aware of kind of the the narcissism of American politics, mm -hmm. that it's, it sees itself as this great savior of the world. And so therefore to admit um, the darkness and the oppression that's going on, um, people aren't willing to do that. And so there, there's some of that. And some of it's religious too. There, there is, if you know the work of Walter Brueggemann, mm -hmm. and he mm -hmm. has a great conversation about the, the lament psalms, about how we don't use these songs a lot in worship. No, they're in our Bible. We all know that most of the Psalms were lament Psalms. But if you look at the songs we sing on Sunday morning, the majority of them are Psalms of triumph and assurance. And so there's something also, I think, religiously that suggests that if we give voice to our despair and to our brokenness, that that, that seems like it's an act of unfaith. Right, right. So we right. can't give voice to it. So that's my point here is also is that it's not just politically important to be honest about the areas of desolation in our mm -hmm. politics. Right. But it's also important to be honest in our religious experience. Otherwise, your relationship with God becomes saccharine. It becomes sugar-coated. And then I think onlookers look at it and say, these people are not truthful. I think mm -hmm. that's, the, that's the price you pay. People look at Christian speech and say, they are not truthful people. They are not mm -hmm. honest people. And so to me, that's why songs like San Quentin are so attractive about Johnny Cash is because he, and, and this is where artists are helpful. Artists are helpful because they help us tell the truth. That's, that's powerful. And, and, you know, I've had so many conversations in as a parish priest and we talk about, um, some of the some of the the big services that we have every year and the ones people want to take part in and of course it's always easter or christmas right and it's these feel good things and and i've often said in in groups why don't you think anybody wants to come out to good friday mm -hmm. you know and it's not because it's at 3 p.m because everybody's off that day anyway but it's this stepping back from this dark place that we don't want to go into mm -hmm. and I, I for me that's monday thursday um and good friday are my favorite yeah. services of the year liturgically and those places that we can go to to say just that like i'm a mess i'm broken we're a mess we're broken 
and we need to lament that and um, and take part in that. So, yeah, so and own powerful. it, right? Yeah, and own it. Yeah, you have to say like 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 I have um, I have contributed to the damage that the world has experienced, and, and right. I have found my piece of that. Um, there are mm -hmm. a long line of people that could stand in my life and say, "You've hurt me," and mm -hmm. I need to I need to own that and and right. do what I can to to fix that and repair that. You know, who was really good at this and knows this really well is like the recovery community, the AA yeah. community. Mm. kind of owning, owning your stuff and the way you've hurt people. Um, because, it, but that's why a lot of people think the recovery community is, is more like a church because it's more honest in that regard. Right. 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 In normal right. church where people kind of hiding that over a little bit, yeah. um, yeah. trigger coding their themselves a bit. I was thinking about to, just, yeah. Sorry, I, it's hard to get away with that on Good Friday, though. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And I was just thinking, as an aside, like the, one of the churches I ended up working at some time ago, I showed up and their, their uh, mission statement or what was on all their bulletins and the sign was, "We're the friendliest church in the neighborhood." Right? <laughs> and I'm like, I'm like, no, you're not. <laughs> but but you know, that's that's not. Let's we we try to be friendly, of course. But what would it be like to have a sign that says, "We're a broken mess." Yeah, and we own it, and you'd fit in really well here, folks. Yeah. You know, you're a hot a, mess. Well, it's what it's what yeah. Nadia it's what Nadia done right with the name all sinners and saints. You know, and right. I, I, you know, like that. What you just said about taking ownership of stuff. Rob and I, Ian as well. We, we've had a lot of guests over the last little while since this, uh, since George Floyd. Uh, you know, and yeah. and and Breonna Taylor, and um, you know, a lot of people can smell uh, what's disingenuine. A uh, mile away, you know, which is why so many folks are leery at church. Uh, but we've been talking a lot about this ownership bit, right? So if we're ever going to make any progress in terms of race, uh, you know, uh, whether it's America or Canada, we've the same issues uh, when it comes down to that. So we've been trying to find conversations even on here and elsewhere where we have the opportunity to be honest about the ways my life has been shaped by racism. Uh, by the ways I've been privileged by the fact that I'm a cisgendered, white, married man, male. Um, so I think that that ownership of it is the big piece. I mean, if you mm -hmm. can actually begin the conversation with knowing that we all take part in it, um, then then there's a way forward. But right. this denial is what kills us. Yeah, yeah. Well, just before we let you go, uh, Richard, just a couple of the things I want to ask you about. First, I wanted to point our listeners to your great blog, which is experimentaltheology.blogspot.com. Certainly want to point people toward that, and we can get on our website, too. I think Ian can take care of that for us. Or, Link in the um, description. Yeah, yeah, we'll get that um, on our website for people to see. And one of the th things that you've had on your on your uh, uh, blog is a photo of the cover of your next book project, which is called Hunting Magic Eels. Love this. You have the greatest yeah. titles. I think this, I think Richard gets the greatest titles award. Yeah. Do you need a Do you need a license for that, or is that like moose or anything That's else? Awesome. Hunting awesome. Magic Eels. Yeah. yeah. My publisher came up with that title. So okay. we were, we run whales. So the book opens with me and whales. Okay. Beautiful. And we were visiting an island of a Celtic saint who is the Saint Valentine's of whales. And the reason why she was the St. Valentine's is because people would come to her abbey because in the abbey was this well that had these enchanted eels in it. And if you threw in a token from your lover into the well and the eels disturbed it, that was a sign that your lover would be faithful for the rest of their life. So obviously pilgrimages, like who needs premarital counseling, right? <laughs> pilgrimages, pilgrimages skyrocket, you know, and just driving that. So we were on the island, you know, trying to find out where this, you know, where this well was with the magic eels in it. So that's the opening story. And the, 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 the publisher just said, that's weird and quirky enough, I guess, that people will pull the book off the shelf and go like, what's this book about? But that's yeah. what we were doing. Yeah story we That's were great. in Good. celtic whales looking for these magical eels any idea when we can get our hands on that is that coming up it's coming out in march so it's, march. it's still a ways away that was just a cover reveal and so it'll come out in the spring okay. and and the book is about enchantment right it's about yeah. this sort of age of disenchantment and yeah so the book is about you know the rising tide of, of disbelief rising atheism, agnosticism, secularism, the rise of the nuns, those who aren't affiliated. And so sociolo sociologists have called that disenchantment, 
of the, the losing kind of the our, our, our sense of the supernatural of enchantment mystery so the yeah, mystery so the book is about how do we recover an enchant so the, the subtitle of the book is recovering an enchanted faith in a secular age so it's how we can recover an enchanted experience of god um in, in an increasing in an age of increasing disbelief mm. and to give you guys a quick window into that the main argument in the book is that increasingly we think christianity is about belief like do i believe in these things that i increasingly find unbelievable um instead the argument of the book is enchantment flows out of practices of attention mm. god is still there god is still working but we've lost our ability to to name god in our disenchanted age and mm. so christianity isn't about forcing yourself to believe in unbelievable things it is rather to retrain yourself to see the God who's always there and has always been there. Right, right. Well, gee, that's great. We look forward wow. to that. And uh, hopefully maybe down the road when that's out for a little bit, we can get you back and, and maybe talk a little bit more about that. That'd be fantastic. So and other books? We Sorry, can plan, I was just going to say we can plan a field trip to Wales and hunt some eels. Yeah, I'm why not? So down. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'm so down. Love me Wales. Wales I'm is really in. cool. So look forward to that. Again, experimentaltheology.blogspot.com for folks that want to check that out. Link uh, in book, the description. Uh, link in the description on our website. And uh, Stranger God, another one of Richard's books we highly recommend. And of course, about Johnny Cash. So we've highlighted some great ones. And I certainly encourage our listeners to check them out and, and uh, find out more about that. So uh, Richard, we're coming to the end of our time. Uh, can't thank you enough for, for spending the time with us. And we know this will be a special episode for, for all of our listeners to tune in. So thank you. Oh, it was great being with you. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you so much. And I guess the next question I have for you is we think about what's coming up next. Next week, we're going to have Fu Lu here with us. Who, have, have, have you any idea who this is, Richard? Who? Is, uh, Fu Lu. <laughs> it's it's P-H-U-C and then L-U-U. -U. He's in Houston, I think. Uh, but he's, he's written a great book called Jesus of the East. Um, oh, that's but, new to me. Yeah. So check him out. And, and a book is fantastic. Uh, he's going to be with us next week. We look forward to that. Uh, uh, the week after that, we have um, Michael Weir, who was the spiritual religious advisor during the re-election campaign for Barack Obama. And uh, he has an, uh, he's now part of something called the AND campaign, A-N-D. And uh, this is a book they've just released called Compassion and Conviction. He'll be on with us. And a reminder that we have a giveaway going on right now, folks. If you're listening to this, we also had Ruth Hunt, Baroness Hunt of Bethnal Green with us on, on Tuesday past. That episode is, is up. You, if you're listening to this, you've already listened to that. Uh, but there's a uh, tweet us or Facebook message us or email us at bickerscrossing or bickerscrossing at gmail.com and tell us where Ruth Hunt grew up. Uh, she says it in the, in the podcast and you'll enter to win a copy of her book, the book of queer prophets, um, okay. which is a collection of 24 great essays. So. Great. And our, our final piece of business, just again, to thank our sponsors, a Miller George funeral home, um, Hyde Park Care Pharmacy and our good friends at Molly Maid. Thank you for your support. So Richard, we wish you well. We know there's lots going on down there in Texas and we hope your, your family and, and loved ones are safe and, and doing okay. We'll certainly continue to keep praying for you as we move forward. Yeah, just pray for my AC. If it keeps working, yeah, we'll, yeah, we'll we need it. <laughs> exactly. So thanks everybody for tuning in and we'll see you again next time in the Vickers Crossing where faith intersects with the public square. And for Ian and for Kevin and for Richard, my name is Rob, and remember, Kevin, to always look both ways. Before you cross the street. Thank you for listening. Our hosts are Kevin George and Rob Henderson. Our producer and composer is myself, Ian, with original artwork done by Elizabeth Dodman. If you have any questions or want to know where to find us, tweet us at Vickers Crossing or find us on Facebook at The Vickers Crossing. If you have any other questions about anything heard on this podcast, leave us a comment or look in the description to find out more. Thanks. Thanks.